Good morning again from Tajikistan. In this video blog, I'm going to discuss this concept of digital identity <clears throat> and how I exhibit this concept myself. Uh, our digital identity is that impression that we want to convey through our various communications and engagements with others through the digital environment. The best way I have thought of to describe it is through a scene found in the classic sci-fi film, The Matrix. Uh, when Keanu Reeves' character, Neo, is first jacked into the Matrix, he is surprised to see that his clothing and appearance have all changed, to which the character Morpheus explains that he is observing what they call residual self-image. In the Matrix, Neo's mind has depicted what he really wanted to look like. Similarly, we often attempt to communicate a different reality in our digital engagements with others to make ourselves or our situation appear better than it may actually be. My personal digital identity is most often exhibited through one of three sources. My Facebook account, my Instagram account, and my professional emails. Uh, the first two are very similar, especially because my Instagram is linked to my Facebook. So anything posted on Instagram is immediately shared on my Facebook. Uh, most of what I post uh, are photos or, or things like that that I've taken myself. Like most people, I only present pictures that... Uh, that present my kids as adorable. My family life is chaotic but desirable and myself as awesome as possible. Uh, once I've picked the best pictures, I run them through the appropriate filters so they look like an amazing photographer. This only helps to reinforce the image that I've got it all together. I also mentioned my email as well. Uh, while I am well-spoken and not a raging idiot, I sometimes require time to craft the right message. In my professional emails, I often proofread and revise them at least once or twice before sending them. This often provides the impression that I am as well-spoken in person as I am in my emails, and sometimes I even convince myself of this. Now, this is not to say that my digital identity is entirely fabricated and that my communications of the facts of my life within Facebook or uh, Instagram are completely made up. However, certain things are omitted. Other things are included, and of the included items, some of them are embellished just a little bit or presented in a more glorious light. My kids are great and adorable, but they're also kids, and no one wants to see my kids on a bad day, just as I don't want to see other people's kids on bad days. Technology enables us to communicate our lives by enabling a captured moment perspective. It's like when you want to send someone an image of something on your computer screen, so you take a screenshot. You can then share that image uh, of what is on your screen, but you have, to, you have other things on the screen that also appear in the image that you don't want to share with that person. So you use the crop tool and you reduce the image to just the specific thing on the screen that you wish to share. Our digital, our digital identity and our captured moment perspective works in the same way. Often people don't realize that our digital identity is not necessarily made up of how we perceive ourselves. Uh, although we like to think that, but it's, it's made up of how others perceive us. What if the leather pants and the trench coat that we saw Neo wearing in the Matrix was not actually what he saw himself wearing, uh, but what Morpheus saw? Uh, this plays out in the marketing concept of brand management. Many businesses think that they can manage their brand by convincing customers to perceive the brand in a certain way by telling them what the brand is. Smart marketers, on the other hand, know that the better way to create a particular brand image within the customer is to be the brand. You aren't just telling the customer what you look like, you're allowing the customer to see what you look like. Just like the business influencing brand image, the individual uses technology to shape and influence how other pre people perceive their identity. Now, all of this uh, makes it seem like uh, the manufacturing of our digital identity is very deliberate. Uh, but I would submit that, like all the other technologies, this concept has evolved from something else. If you remember the MySpace era, the image you were trying to convey was much different, and mostly because of the format of the page. Uh, you could only post certain things or formats, but one of the things that was a necessity was your background music. At the time, what you could put on the page was limited to the constraints of the tech at the time. Eventually, Facebook and the ways they evolved website building relative to both the page construction as well as the expansion in programming made my, uh, MySpace obsolete because there was so much more that you could do within Facebook's platform. The risk with digital identity that I briefly mentioned at the beginning is that the owner of that identity is at risk of buying their own BS. The more you manufacture and massage the information and imagery that you present as your digital identity, the more likely you are to start believing that this is actually what your life is. For example, I like to run. 
I'm not good at it, and I do it far less here in Tajikistan because of my work schedule and the horrible air quality. But when I'm back home, I, I really do enjoy running regularly. A uh, while back, I was fairly consistent running three to four times per week, anywhere from three to eight miles per session. And, and I never forgot to start my running app before I went out running. Um, there is an adage that says uh, among runners, if it isn't on Strava, it didn't happen. Strava, Map My Run, whatever your, your app is, if it wasn't on your app, it didn't happen. Uh, by default, all my runs posted to my app, which then reposted to my Facebook. At the time, I justified it as allowing my wife to pinpoint where I was for safety reasons. Uh, if I stopped at a location for more than five or so minutes, uh, I may have been hurt or needed assistance. Uh, in reality, most of my friends um, started becoming convinced that I was this great runner because there was always a run on my Facebook wall. And the more I received this feedback from my friends, the more I shifted from thinking that I was an average runner to a great runner. The drawback to that is when you run your first marathon with very little preparation and it takes you 50 minutes longer than you planned. I did it, I got the 26.2 sticker on my car, but I'm not a great runner. Our digital identity can affect how we communicate our life in part because we are self-conscious or self-aware of what other people think. Uh, our self-esteem comes into play and, and how we perceive others' perceptions of us. There are things about our private lives that we would rather keep to ourselves. Perhaps they are dirty little secrets, but they are also those parts of us that we may be embarrassed about or that we think others perceive as inferior. I only learned this recently, but when women take selfies, the reason that they hold the camera above eye level, at least for some, is because it forces them to look slightly skyward, making the skin underneath their chins tight, presenting a more slim appearance. Uh, well, men may not do this exact thing. Uh, we're not immune to this either. Which of us has never had our photo taken and been forced to suck in a gut or puff out a chest and stand up straight? It's because no one really wants a dad bod, no matter what the media says, and we are trying to convey a positive image of ourselves, or at least who we wish we were, um, or perhaps who we used to be. Uh, residual self-image, again, I, I love that concept. This is really what it comes down to. Who do we try to convey when establishing and forming our digital identity? Do we crop out all of the bad stuff, or do we present some of the reality of life? I try to do that once in a while for a couple of reasons. First, it allows other people in my circles to feel the freedom to be real periodically. People often feel constrained by unrealistic expectations in the world around them, so by relaxing my own constraints, I provide the ability for others around me to do the same. Second, it helps keep me from thinking that the manufactured reality is reality. When we constantly surround ourselves with a false reality, uh, a false perception, we begin to perceive that to be true, uh, which can have negative consequences outside the obvious when the expectation to maintain that reality persists. Thank you.